Hi everyone, welcome back to the Sun Level Learning Lab. My name is Miss Alford, and today we are going to be talking about story elements, what they are, and then we're gonna be reading a short passage and um, discussing what the different story elements are in the story, making some connections. So let's get started. Okay, so I just want to start this all off with a little story, story time. So last weekend, I went to California, and um, I went to California with one of my best friends. His name is Adrian. And when we got to California, we decided to, we came up with a great idea where we thought it would be awesome if we called and made um, a reservation to go skydiving. So we call and we put some money down, money you cannot get back, and we reserve our spot. So the next day we show up to go skydiving and they tell us we are signing our lives over. We woke up freaking out. We were so nervous. So when we got there and they told us that, we were even more nervous. But um, First, I'm gonna show you a picture. So they tell us that um, who, they, they get us all strapped up. They tell us, you know, this is what you're gonna do. This is how it's gonna go. And um, you, I'm freaking out. My, my best friend's freaking out. And so we get all strapped up, suited up, and we get into the plane. It was a really small plane. I don't know if you can tell, but there's just, um, my friend, his person, his instructor, me, and then my instructor. And the instructors consider the person you're like jumping with. And you're going 10,000 feet up in the air. So we get into this little plane and they keep the door open the entire time. And we're freaking out. We're like, hey, um, excuse me, are you going to are you going to close that door? And they, they're like, no, we're going to keep it open like majority of the time. So we fly over the ocean. And this is where um, my instructor instructor makes me stick my hand out. And I'm really nervous, but the door is open the entire time. So we're both sitting there holding on for a dear life and um, so nervous. And they close the door. We are about 8,000 feet up and we have to get to 10,000. And that's when they start to... Um, strap us up really, really tight and make us put on goggles so that, you know, we're, our eyes don't dry out, everything's safe, blah, 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 blah. And my friend, Adrian, decided that he was going to be the one to jump first. So he was extra, extra scared. So I watch him jump out of the plane and he screamed as he jumped out. And this is my facial react, facial expression, my initial reaction the second I see him fly out of the plane. I'm freaking out. This is my face of complete terror. And this is when my instructor says, are you ready? Are, this, it's your turn. Are you ready to jump out? So I am freaking out. And 15 seconds after my friend jumped, I jumped. And this is me in the air. So the initial, the, the first second we drop out of the plane, I'm screaming. I am like closing my eyes. I'm doing my best. I'm so nervous. And um, I think I got to the point where I just like felt comfortable. So I was like at ease with all of it. And you fall for 45 seconds. And then that's when they pull the parachute. That's called a free fall. When you just fall, there's no parachute. We free fell for 45 seconds. And then they pull the parachute and um, you like, you um, make your way down for five to seven minutes. So the five to seven minutes was really cool because you got to see all of, you know, um, the California coast. You got to see the water. You got to see all different parts of California as you were parachuting down back to the land. But this is when I start to, uh, started to feel more comfortable and was actually enjoying it and not freaking out the whole time. But this was my weekend. This was um, my fun in California. Very spontaneous. I've been getting the question, would you do it again? And I think I most definitely would. It was really cool to go and see this sort of thing um, and see the beach and see the water and get to fly over that. So I think I would definitely do it again. 
Um, yeah. Okay. That was just my story before we got started. But our objective for today's lesson is I can understand how elements of a story connect to each other. So it makes me think, I just told a story. And what parts of a story were there? There was me, Miss Alford, and my friend Adrian. We went to California, we went to San Diego, and we went skydiving. So we have our characters, we have our setting of in the plane, in California, in the air, and back onto land. So we have a couple of different settings and our plot is the actions and events that happen are going to be, we're super nervous, we're, we book it, we're super nervous, we're super scared we show up. And then we um, get in the plane, still freaking out. And then we jump out and we are screaming and crazy nervous at first when we leave the plane, but we are eventually feeling relaxed and enjoying the ride as we make it back down. And those are story elements. Our story elements consist of our, our characters, our setting, and our plot. And our plots are events that happen in a story. So I just told you a story, and maybe without even thinking about it, you knew who was involved in the story, you knew where it was happening, and you knew the step-by-step -step of what was going on, but those are all gonna be our story elements. And our plot can also um, consist of an introduction, a rising action, a climax, a falling action, and a resolution. Well, my introduction here was um, how we called and booked our reservation to go skydiving. The rising action was going up in the plane, the climax was jumping out of the plane, and the falling action was enjoying the ride. So there's, it's those sorts of things where you might not know exactly what, you might not read a story, you might not listen to a story and be like, hey, I know that you're taught what characters, you're not, and what setting is going on, but it's those kind of connections that you can make that are each in, uh, the, of those story elements that take place in a story. Our dialogue is another big aspect of story elements. Our dialogue is conversation, any conversation between characters. And this is different from the narrator explaining and describing things. Our dialogue uses quotation marks. So how might that look? Well, how do we know who's talking? So an author won't just say, um, Billy said, Joey said, he said this and then that and then blah, 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 blah. No, our we, our author is going to introduce dialogue or use dialogue in a way that flows. So if something's going on or if something is, is there's a conversation going on, he's, the author is going to say something along these lines, that's it, he shouted, or maybe it's the character's name. That's it, Miss Alfred shouted. So, and then he's also using his quotation marks because that is what is coming out of the character's mouth. So that's how we know who is talking when our author um, writes dialogue in this sort of sense. And another way to understand who is talking and another way that our author might um, show us dialogue is through new lines or new paragraphs, which also is when the new character is talking. So here we have one line, it says, I work here too, she said. My name is Karen. Did you say something about a monster? We have our quotation marks, we have our she said, but in the conversation, we know that it's Karen who's talking because she says her name out loud. Well, we're not told who says this, and this is taken from a, the short story that we're gonna read, but the next character just answers, I was just goofing off. And then the next character talks, maybe this was what you heard. Question mark, she uses her quotation marks. She reached into the shadows, so that's her action. She reached into the shadows and pulled out a crazy looking machine. So the author uses quotation marks and the question, and then also follows it up with an action that the, uh, character is doing. So we know that the character is doing all of that 
one thing, having that con conversation and also doing something as they're speaking or right after they're speaking. And then the, char the next character, other character says, oh, I figured that was the sound. So this is where we're gonna be able to see that a new line or a new paragraph really shows us when a new character is talking. And sometimes the, the author might show us right away that he said or she said or Karen said or Miss Alford said, and then we can follow, you know, if it's a conversation between two people, it's gonna be every other line. But most of the time it's gonna be in the text of what the author chooses to say and ch chooses how to word different things. So that's why we have to pay close attention to verbs and adverbs that are used in the dialogue, in the, in the dialogue, also known as the text in the conversation. Said, whispered, screamed, etc. So those verbs are important. Authors choose certain words for certain reasons. So it's important that we pay close attention to the words that they choose to use. So how do these elements affect each other? Why is it and it's important to understand what each of them are, our characters, our setting, and our plot, and how our plot um, happens. But how do they come together? How do they affect each other? Well, the setting can affect the plot. You can ask yourself questions like, how would the story be different if it took place somewhere else or at another time? Does the timing, does the, does the time of day affect it? does, um, you know, if it was super duper hot and you don't go to the beach when it's really cold outside and it's snowing, the author chooses to say it was a hot sunny day in California and the characters end up going to the beach. So authors choose certain words, cer certain settings that affect the plot or the story would end up being different. So I wouldn't have, um, I went to California on a trip and we chose to go skydiving, but if we chose to, um, okay, so we have now know that our different story elements how to, what they are, how we find them, and that an author chooses certain story elements, the characters, the plots, and the settings for certain reasons. Well, how do these story elements affect each other? They have to. There's a reason why a character or an author chooses to use a character or say, like have a character use certain words in their conversation, or they choose a certain setting because it helps the story that they want to tell. So like I just said, so it's things like the setting affects the plot. Well, how so? When you think of a setting, you might ask yourself, how would the story be different if it took place somewhere else or at another time? Well, think about living in Arizona. It is 110 degrees uh, at during the summer. It gets super, super hot. Well, if I said, hey, let's go take a walk, it's going to be way... I'm not having it right now. Okay, so we talked about how... Um, what the story elements are and we know how to find them obviously because we know that it's just the characters the setting and the plot but and we, we also know that the author chooses these story elements for certain reasons so that brings the question how do we how do these story elements affect each other well it's things like the setting affects the plot so makes you ask the question how would the story be different if it took place somewhere else or at another time? Well, this is really important. Authors choose certain settings for reasons so that they can tell their story. If an author chooses to um, tell a story about a 
big blizzard, a big snowstorm in a state that's going to be really, really cold. They don't choose to tell it in Arizona where it gets to be only, you know, barely cold um, during the winter to tell the story. They choose certain settings because it infl it influences the plot. It, it gives way for the plot to unfold. So when you read a story, you can ask yourself, well, why did they choose to use this setting? Well, because if they didn't, then the plot would have been different. The events that happened throughout the story would have been much different. And then there's things like characters' words um, or the dialogue, so the conversation um, and actions affect each other. So characters, the conversations they have, what they do throughout the story affect other characters. And characters' words, um, their conversation and actions reveal something about the character's personality. So this could also be like maybe a character does one thing and it uh, shows a, another side of them um, when they act a certain way or when they say something. Does it show their mean side? Does it show their heroic side? Does it show their scared side? Um, there are certain conversations and acts that are done that can help us understand a character's personality. And then we have our events of the plot that affect the characters and our events of the plot that affect future events. So sometimes we not, might not always see it, but there's gonna be um, certain events that happen in the text where it might make you question or it might kind of give way to the idea of something in the future happening because of the event the author chose to write or the, um, the words that they use to explain a situation or explain what the character might do next. Some a little bit more about the story elements affecting one another. All of these are very good examples of cause and effect relationship. If one thing happens, if one thing is done, then there is um, a kind of like a chain reaction. You start off a story in one way and it's going to keep continue, continue, continue. And because you do one thing, you get an effect. So you have a cause and you have an effect. And that's how a lot of these relationships are going to look. That's how these story elements affect one another. It's like a cause and effect relationship. And good readers are always thinking about and looking for these relationships. So you might want to ask yourself as we read these stories and you read any story, how do the parts of the story, how do these story elements all fit together? because they have to fit together somehow. They tell a story. They make us use our imagination. The author chooses certain words for the very reason of telling the story that they did. So it's important as a reader to read and infer and make connections as to why did they choose to uh, make it happen there? Why did the character have that conversation with, that, with another character? Why did um, the character act a certain way and did a certain event happen that would pave the way for something else to happen. So throughout the reading, I want you to focus on the dialogue and how um, it affects our characters, how our characters affect the plot, how our setting affects our, um, our plot and maybe the characters too. I just wanted to throw this out there. Um, as we read the story, there is a word, it's cubicle. And I don't know, some people might be familiar with this word and maybe some aren't, but a cubicle, just so that we know before we start reading the short story, is a partially enclosed cube shaped area that people work in, most of the time inside of an office. So I put included a picture and these are cubicles. They look kind of like a, they are in a cube shape, but they're not closed all the way. And this is what people work in. They get, um, have quiet workspace. They have um, a little bit of privacy. They have um, just space that they can work in when they're at work. 
Okay. So we are going to read the story now. Okay, so this, I can't get this to go away. So this is um, titled At the Office. All right, wait here, sweetheart, said Albert's mother, and I'll be done in a minute. Just hang out and have some, I'll have to move that really quick, guys, I'm sorry. This short story is titled At the Office. Wait here, sweetheart, said Albert's mother, and I'll be done in a minute. Just hang out and have some fun. With that, she was gone. There was a lot wrong with those two sentences. For one thing, Albert was too old. Okay, so now we're gonna read the short story. And if you um, don't wanna listen to me read it out loud, then feel free to just pause the video, pause the screen and read it, read out loud to yourself or read to yourself. Um, and then skip to the next couple of slides too to keep reading the story and just pick up with us as we start discussing after. Okay, so this short story is titled At the Office. Wait here, sweetheart, said Albert's mother, and I'll be done in a minute. Just hang out and have some fun. With that, she was gone. There was a lot wrong with those two sentences. For one thing, Albert was too old for his mother to be calling him sweetheart, especially in public. For another, he knew it would take a longer than a minute for his mom to take care of the work she had to finish that night. It would take more than 15 minutes. It could take as long as 60 or 70 of them. But most importantly, there was simply no way he would have fun, not for 60 minutes, not alone in mom's office. It was after six o'clock and the whole building was empty, safe for, security, safe for the security guard on the first floor, the floor where mom worked was a long expanse of cubicles, tiny rooms with no ceilings, no doors, and the walls made out of something that looks like carpet. It wasn't a stretch to say that Albert felt like a mouse in a maze. The difference was that a mouse gets cheese once it makes its way through the maze. Albert didn't have anything to look forward to but homework. A few years later, he, realized he relished these late night trips to his mom's office. The empty cubicles were like tiny forts with crevices he could squeeze himself into while he read or drew pictures. He could recline in people's chairs, pretend to talk on their phones, and leave silly notes on sticky paper for mom's coworkers. The empty office was a sprawling gray kingdom, and he was the king. But those days were long gone. Now Albert looked at the cubicles and just saw cubicles. The chairs were just chairs, the phones were phones, and the empty hallways lit by flickering fluorescent lights were far from being secret passages. If he was honest with himself, and this was a hard thing to admit, the quiet office made him a little bit scared. It didn't help that he could hear a monster. Again, this was something Albert was too old for. He knew there is no monsters in the office, just as there were no ghosts, zombies, or mad scientists. And yet, what else could be making that sound? It came from far off, a deep-throated whoosh, mixed with an occasional grinding noise. He couldn't help picturing some kind of ogre with a big round body and stubby little legs and a mouth the size of a mom's compact car. In one eye, he said to himself, definitely just one eye. It was probably standing guard in front of the elevator, clomping back and forth to make sure that Albert and his mom never escaped the office. They could take the stairs, sure, but the monster probably had friends in there, vampires, bats with pointy little teeth or gnomes who would hang upside down from the stairs and throw rocks at your head, and then they'd jump down on you and pull your hair in. Little gnomes? said Albert, interrupting his own train of thought. Are you nuts? He needed to get a grip, and soon the noise was getting closer. He stood on the chair of the cubicle where he had been hiding. The cubicle walls stretched into the darkness. He climbed back down, not sure if he should hide, do some homework, or go searching for the noise. A rumble in his stomach made his decision for him. He couldn't sit still. He was hungry. Sneaking one foot in front of the other, oh, 
past the cubicles, his heart in his throat, and just as he was nearing the corner at the end of the hallway, the corner that turned into the darkest part of the office, the whoosh stopped. Albert flattened himself against a filing cabinet. If there was a monster, it had gone silent. He ducked under a desk, palm sweaty and his heart racing. What had started as sort of a game had turned into real fear. He closed his eyes for what could have been a few seconds or maybe 10 minutes. He could hear his heart beating in his ears. He was too hungry to stay here all night. His stomach wouldn't let him. Finally, he peered out from under the desk. There was nothing there. Albert stood, his legs sore, and began walking again. And then he heard the sound coming from behind him. That's it, he shouted. This is unfair. You're sneaking around and I don't like it. Just come and face me. The sound stopped. Yeah, I know you're out there. Just step into the light and face me like a grown-up monster. I'm not scared. He heard a little cough. Hello? Is there someone there? The monster was a woman. Yeah, my name is Albert. My mom works here. The monster stepped into the light. A middle-aged woman with a graying ponytail wearing a sandy-colored uniform. I work here too, she said. My name is Karen. Did you say something about a monster? I was just goofing off. Maybe this is what you heard. She reached into the shadows and pulled out a crazy looking machine with a long handle and a big furry wheels. It's a floor buffer. It polishes the floor. Oh, I figured that's what the sound was. Where's your mom? In her office doing work. You kind of bored? Kind of. Hungry? Albert nodded. Karen jerked her head as if to say, come with me. So Albert did. They walked down the half-lit hallway, still creepy, even though he was no longer alone, until they came to a big, heavy door. Karen pulled out a huge ring of keys and unlocked the door. Inside was a kitchen. She took one key off her ring and handed it to him. This'll, lock, this'll unlock the cabinet, she said. Eat up, kid. Karen left and Albert opened the cabinets. Inside were all kinds of snacks peanut butter crackers, jelly beans, apples, and cereal. He gorged himself, making a feast out of the office food. It was still dark in the hallway, but he found that it was impossible to be frightened and full at the same time. All right. So after we read that, let's take a little look at the um, different story elements from this short story. So our characters, who were our characters? We know that there is Albert, we have Albert's mother, and then we have um, Karen who works in the, Albert's mother's office. And that's who we had the conversation with, both between Albert and Karen. What's our setting? We have uh, the setting as Albert's mother's office with all these cubicles. In our plot, well, our plot starts off as Albert being in his mom's um, office, and it's they say it's like six o'clock at night, and it's kind of getting late. There's nobody else there. It's pretty um, dark and lonely, but Albert's kind of torn between getting caught up in the fact that it's dark and there's potential noises or if he should just you know do his homework not let his imagination get the best of him and keep going on his day as he normally would but we see that he kind of lets it get to his head and he's considering the fact that oh my gosh this noise could be a monster and I don't want to take the elevator and what about his monstrous friends until he comes to um, comes into contact with Karen, who ends up telling him that the noise that he was hearing was just a floor polisher. And he tries to act like, oh, you're right. Like, I, yeah, to say monster, that's just so silly of me. So he kind of reverts back to that, like, I'm too old, I'm too good to be thinking any of that. And then she later um, shows him where all the food's at, and he just kind of devours all of the office food. So we have our different story elements. Well, now it's time to consider how do these story elements affect each other? So 
let's see the examples of our connections and our cause and effect. So for some of these, they're gonna have multiple answers. You as a reader are allowed to infer as many things as you want from our different evidence. So anything that the author writes, you are allowed to make inferences and you're allowed to discuss and think um, whatever it is you want to. But when we're making, when we're inferring information, we're trying to make connections, we don't just want it to be anything. You know, there's no wrong answer, but we want our answers to be reasonable. We can't just say, oh, um, Albert was so happy and so excited to be at his mom's office and it was the best night of his life. There's nowhere in the text that says that. And the exact opposite was actually what happened. So we have to make reasonable um, inferences and things that you know actually make sense and can kind of be backed up from the text. All right, so first let's take a look at our setting. So we know that it says it was after six o'clock and the whole building was empty, save for the security guard on the first floor. The floor where mom worked was a long expanse of cubicles, tiny rooms with no ceilings, no doors and walls made out of something that looked like carpet. It was a stretch to say that Albert felt like a mouse in a maze. The difference was that a mouse gets, one, gets cheese once it makes its way through the maze. Albert didn't have anything to look forward to but homework. So here, our, um, let me get this. Our author tells us the time. So it's six o'clock. So Albert's done with school. Um, his, maybe his, his mom has, like she says, she has more work to get done. And it's later in the night. The whole building is empty. So he's ex the author is explaining the setting to us. Say for security, the security guards on the first floor. And then they tell us the floor where he's at, where mom works, is a long, long line of cubicles. But we know that there's nobody in the cubicles. So, and he says, it wasn't a stretch to say that Albert felt like a mouse in a maze. So we know that when we go to really, really big places, say like a big warehouse, and you're like, only it's just you and another person. When you hear a slight little sound, you might be like, oh, what's that? You know, when it's, when it's a busy, if, if, if this was at three o'clock in the afternoon and it was a busy office, Albert probably wouldn't be there because he's at school. And it, it's not, you know, scary it's not empty there's no way for him to get nervous at all because of the busyness that is going on but here we know at six o'clock the whole building was empty and his mom worked in on the one where there was all the cubicles and no people and then it also we also have a line that says it was probably standing guard in front of the elevator clomping back and forth to make sure that albert and his mom never escapes the office. So this is when he's talking about the um, the elevator and the monsters and why he doesn't want to go down the elevator or, or why he wouldn't want to um, go down the stairs because his mon the monster's friends might be there. So this is where his imagination really gets the best of him, but he wouldn't be um, considering this if he wasn't in an office. You go home, you might have the stairs, but you don't have an elevator. There's nobody keeping guard. He feels like trapped. And most of the time, you know every ins and out of your house and you wouldn't really feel trapped or you wouldn't always give somebody the opportunity to give, make you feel trapped. So here, our setting really, really speaks, speaks volume for us and allows us to understand that if our setting was any different, the plot would have been different. So how would the story be different if it took place someone else, somewhere else, or at another time? Well, we said, if it happened at three o'clock in the afternoon, it would be a busy office, and Albert probably wouldn't be there because he would be at school, and it would be so busy, and there'd be so many people that there would be no way that Albert could get scared or nervous or think of any small noise as a monster or a big noise. So this is where it's important for us to be able to know our setting, but also understand how it affects 
the plot because if the setting was different, then our plot would be different. All right, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the character. So Albert, Albert was too old for his mother to be calling him sweetheart, especially in public. For another, he knew it would take a lot longer than a minute for his mom to take care of the work she had to finish that night. It would take more than 15 minutes. It could take as long as 60 or 70 of them, but most importantly, there was simply no way he would have fun, not for 60 minutes, not alone in mom's office. So we can ask ourselves, what do we learn about Albert's character here? Well, it says his, he's, too, he's too old for his mother to be calling him sweetheart. So he, doesn't, he, he feels embarrassed. He knows that when his mom says, okay, work might take 15 minutes, he knows it's gonna take a lot longer because he's used to his mom taking a lot longer than 15 minutes. So he has a real good um, understanding of like reality and what is, you know, the truth. He seems like maybe he's like a preteen, maybe he's um, not quite in middle school, but he has a good understanding of quite a bit. And he also knows that there's no way that he would have fun in his mom's office and not alone and not for 60 minutes. So we know that he's okay, maybe a little bit, he's a little bit older. He knows what's going on. He's been obviously to his mom's office plenty of times and he's just kind of over it and he just doesn't want anything to do with anything. And then we go and jump to the story where he's searching for this monster. He's looking for this noise and he is freaking out. He's nervous, he's in fear. And it says, sneaking one foot in front of the other, Albert crept down the line of cubicles, his heart in his throat. So this is where we just know he's scared. So what do we learn about Albert's character at this point in the story? Well, we learn that his imagination got the best of him when it came to fear. And his fear allowed him to believe that there was a monster in the office. So he went and searched for it. And as he was searching for it, he got more and more scared. So although we thought in the beginning, he's this older, you know, too good for his mom to be, or too old for his mom to be calling him sweetheart. And he has this like really big grasp on reality. We then learn later down the, in the story that he has, um, he still has his imagination. He's still pretty young and he still is in fear. He's not too big and bad to not believe that there's monsters, but um, that is what this, these actions and this text tells us. So how does the character affect the plot in this sense? Well, we know that if he was 16, 17, 18, older, that he wouldn't have gotten scared. He probably would have just continued on with his homework and went about his day. And he went about whatever, however long, if it was 15 minutes, 60, 70 minutes that his mom went and worked, that he would have to wait um, with all the empty cubicles and the empty desk and whatever noise. But we know that the character is still young enough and he let his imagination get the best of him and he was in a lot of, he had a lot of fear and wanted to figure out if this was a monster, if it was real, what was going on, all these things are going on in his head. And that is how our plot like thickens. That's what happens throughout the story. So if our character was too old, our story never would have been able to happen. He never would have gone, uh, been so fearful. He never would have ran into Karen. He never would have found out that it was just a vac or a floor polisher. And the story wouldn't have been able to almost exist. But since the care or since the author chooses our character to maybe start off older and feel older and be bigger and bolder and stronger, the author allows us to see over time that he still has imagination. He still has fear and he still lets all of that get to his head, which creates the plot, all of the events that happen throughout the story. So our characters in how our characters act and what our characters say, their imagination, their emotions, their feelings do affect the plot. And we've seen that. We, we were able to see through Albert's personality, through his actions, through his words, he was talking to himself, the things that he thought that could exist in this off big old office building, he, he really did think 
was a monster. So now we jump to some conversation, some dialogue, which is a very small amount of dialogue throughout the story. But it says, yeah, I know you're out there. Just step into the light and face me like a grown-up monster. I'm not scared. So this is when um, Albert gets pretty close to everything, and he keeps hearing a noise, but they're not coming out. And he's it stops, and it starts, and he's a little nervous. And then he hears a little cough. Hello, is someone there? The monster was a woman. Yeah, my name is my name is Albert. My mom works here. The monster stepped into the light. A middle-aged woman with a gray ponytail wearing a sandy colored uniform. I work here too, she said. My name is Karen. Did you say something about a monster? Maybe this is what you heard. She reached into the shadow and pulled out a crazy looking machine with a long handle and a big furry big furry wheels. It's a floor buffer. It polishes the floors. Oh, I figured that's what the sound was. So when we read this, Although it might not seem like a lot, it might just seem like a small conversation, but it really makes us question, how did this conversation change the direction of the story? How did um, this conversation kind of make um, Albert change his emotions and change his thoughts and change his kind of whole character altogether. So I want you to think about for a second, just pause the video and really think why, wh what, what changed here? How did this change the story? How did this, the, the story was going one way with monsters and a fearful Albert and um, a quiet, creepy looking office and now it's like a 180 we are on we meet a new character and do we have a different direction so pause the video and really think look at look at the text maybe pay attention to these um last two lines that we have down here and think what could this what new direction could this be going in Okay, so now that you've had some time to think, when we take a close look at these last two um, sentences right here, it says, maybe this is what you heard. She reached into the shadows and pulled out a crazy looking machine with a long handle and big furry wheels. It's a floor buffer, it polishes the floor. So up until this moment, Albert thinks that there's a big monster in the office. And that is what we have up until this very line. So then we, she says this and she allows us to understand, okay, it's not a monster. It's a floor buffer and it's nothing. And then Albert says, oh, I figured that's what the sound was. So we have a complete different direction of how he says this. He says, Okay, so now that you've had some time to take a look at and think about what direction this um, conversation makes the plot or the story in general kind of change, um, you ask yourself, or maybe my big question was, how did the conversation between Karen and Albert change the direction of the story? Well, we have here, Maybe this was what you heard. She reached into the shadows and pulled out a crazy looking machine with a long handle and big furry, furry wheels. It's a floor buffer, it polishes the floor. And we have Albert who says, oh, I, I figured that was, that was the sound. It makes us question what was going on before this. So up until this point, we knew, or we were under the impression, we thought that this noise was a monster up until this last line that's up here on the slide. When uh, Karen says that it is just the floor buffer. And Albert was scared that entire time up until this point. But how does Albert's reaction change? How does, how does his voice change? How does, his, how does 
does his fear go away? Is he still nervous? Is how, when he talks to Karen, does he, is he just like, Oh my gosh, like I thought it was, was he still in fear or did he kind of catch himself saying, Oh my gosh, I just like let my imagination get the best of me. Yeah. I figured that was the sound. So we have this conversation and these lines that really change the direction of the story. And Karen brings him back to like reality and brings him back, you know, level headed and lets him see that it's just a floor polisher. So it this with this conversation, what how would the how would the story have been different if maybe he didn't encounter Karen or um he didn't hear a cough or she said oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't hear that. And does the, does the story change? It does. It changes the rest of the story. Maybe he continues on his adventure to go and find the monster, but he still lays there in fear. Or maybe Karen says that she heard something too. And so maybe this makes him want to go search some more. Maybe he's too nervous and wants to go tell his mom. So this conversation between the two characters, this dialogue, really changes the direction of the plot of the story and the author does this on purpose because he wants um albert to come back to reality come back to earth and really see that it is just a monster like okay you're a little too old maybe to be thinking that or you let your imagination get the best of you and you sat there in fear the whole time okay so that's it for the examples. And now we're gonna do a little bit of a recap. So what are story elements? Well, we talked about these through the entire lesson. Story elements are gonna be our characters, our setting, and our plot. And the plot is gonna be all of those events that happen throughout the story. Well, we kinda, we looked at a short story. We were able to pick out what our story elements are. But we were also able to see how they connected. and why authors choose certain story elements to tell a story. They don't just choose random things and tell the most random story. Maybe they do and their story, one character, one act, or one setting leads to a next and maybe it brings a new good idea. And, but everything's all connected and authors choose certain um, story elements, certain characters, and certain um, conversations for reasons to tell a good story. So I leave you with the question, why do we take a closer look at story elements? Why is it important that we do that? Pause the video for a second and just think about it. We talked throughout this entire lesson and we were able to see different examples of the setting um, having an effect on the plot and a setting or um, the characters and how conversations affected other characters or how the conversation changed the direction of the story. So why do we take a closer look at story elements? Pause and think of, maybe think of like a sentence or two as to why. So we take a closer look at story elements to give us a good idea and allow us to understand and make inferences about what the author is saying. We know that authors choose certain settings to tell us a story. And without a certain setting, it might not allow the author to tell that story. So it's our job as a reader to pay close attention to the story elements and make those connections. The, the reason um, Albert, you know, he, it was six o'clock at night and his mom had work to do, but he knew that he was in this big, lonely, um, office and he let his imagination get to him and it caused him to um, be in fear and it caused him to go search for this monster just to find out that it was a um, floor polisher but the author chose to make it somebody who was old enough to not be called sweetheart and have a grip on reality but not old enough to not let his imagination get to him so our author chose to, for the for the character to be that age and we take a closer look at story elements to really understand 
to understand the story and to understand um, how they affect one another, how each story element affects one another and why the author did it. So with that, that is the end of the lesson. I hope you guys were able to take some stuff away from the, from the lesson. And if you want to go back through and really reread the story and take a closer look at the examples and, you know, um, really try to see what the author is saying. And if you want to feel free to go through and find more connections, make more inferences as to um, things the author did. What else can you infer? What else other, what other settings or what other conversations or little actions did Albert do that kind of paved way for other things to happen? So continue looking for those story elements and the connections that are made as you read these stories, as you read this short story, and as you continue um, reading in general. I thank you guys so much and I will see you all soon.